thank you for tuning in. My determination to become an ecologist was stimulated by actually a three week course FSC at Juniper Hall 58 years ago. Fascinated by anthills, I investigated them for my doctorate and produced what I hope is one of the, one of the best explanations of the composition of a plant community in terms of the population dynamics of its species. I published 15 papers on anthills after all. After a school teaching career, during which I taught part-time for Oxford and Open Universities and wrote 10 textbooks, I retired in 2005 and started to research anthills again. My interest was reinforced when the Royal Parks asked me to contribute to Mission Invertebrate from 2017 onwards. Helped by citizen scientists, we collected more data on anthill sizes. I sampled the soil invertebrates in detail, stimulated by yet another FSC course, uh, a four day course on soil invertebrates at Preston Monford. I now realize just how seething grassland soils are and how plant ecologists have failed to take sufficient account of soil animals in discussing plant species richness and distribution patterns. And this is what I'd like to share with you. So this initial slide it shows a typical anthill about 70 centimetres across and say 30 centimetres, 25 centimetres high. And you can see straight away the, dif the difference in vegetation between the anthill and the other. Obviously rough, rough hawk bit, the Ontodon hispidus is the major obvious species surrounding it. And on the anthill, perhaps the white flowers, Cunansi wort, Asperula sinantrica is the most obvious feature, but the most important point is that anthills and the surrounding vegetation differ considerably in vegetation. So the plant conservationists or the animal conservationist gets two habitats in one by having anthills at his site. And these are ideal for teaching students, both people becoming interested in plant and animal life, uh, A-level students, university students and so on, because you get two habitats for your money and you can compare them. So this is a picture from Richmond Park, where we had lots of citizen scientists, some as young as eight, helping to sample the vegetation. Why is this species special? Well, this is a yellow meadow ant, which is the main species in Britain and Northern Europe, which builds, well, Britain anyway, which builds ant hills. So there are 55 species of British ants, uh, roughly, and um, it's probably the most wide ranging and important. It's an allogenic engineer. Well, what do we mean by that? An allogenic engineer is a species which builds structures which are used by a large number of animal, plant, animal and plant species. And the most obvious examples in the Northern Hemisphere are the yellow meadow ant, beavers, and perhaps out of the Northern Hemisphere, corals, which form coral reefs, and termite mounds. And these affect the distribution pattern of many other species. It's a keystone species. Now there are lots of different definitions of a keystone species. Um, on the basis of its weight, its biomass, and the fact that it's not a top predator, it wouldn't be a keystone species. But on the basis of numbers of individuals, it's a keystone species. And also what would happen to a grassland if you remove the yellow meadow ant? which will be quite a striking reduction in species richness. The mounds are very long lived. The longest I've observed is 62 years, but probably more than 500 years at least in a long lived pasture. They contribute tremendously to grassland heterogeneity. Think of the north, south, east and west facing slopes, the, the bumps which are colonized by plants and animals the bare soil which they create, 
uh, producing over position sites for lots of different soil animals. It also affects the grassland between the anthills in an unexpected ways as I'll explain and have a considerable effect on fauna and flora. Now this is a, a red ant man for Michael Rufa probably from a pine forest. Why isn't this as important? Well, these mounds are only temporary and um, they're made out of pine needles, not soil. So they don't affect the distribution of plants so much. And with the succession death of the trees above, they're relatively temporary compared with yellow meadow ant mounds in pastures. So I called this seething soils. Why are they seething? Well, I looked at three sites in Richmond Park, 210 soil samples on the mounds and between the mounds. And um, I came out with some quite striking results. In Richmond Park, which is acid grassland, each square metre of anthill soil contained nearly 70,000 worker ants and 844 aphids. That's root dwelling aphids on the surface, on the roots of the grasses. Each square metre of soil between the anthills contained about 5,500 worker ants. This was down to about 12 centimetres, probably an underestimate. So every time you walk over a grassland, you're probably treading on a hundred worker ants. Amazing. At maximum, uh, the anthill surfaces make up a sixth of the total grassland area and um, the occupied anthills contain 73% of the ants, which means that 27% are between the anthills and the aphids are farmed. The point is that these ants farm underground aphids which is their main source of diet. You don't see the ants because they mainly build at night after rain and you don't see the aphids because they're on the plant roots but they're there all the time where 94% of the aphids occur between the anthills in groups largely on the roots of grasses. So massive seething soils which one doesn't appreciate just walking over a grassland. They occur, these anthills, in acidic, calcareous and neutral grass and salt marshes like Old Hole Marshes in Essex, Sea Cliff, Mountain Grass and Old Parklands, marshes, roadside, verges and churchyards. And they used to be far, far more abundant. The old agricultural reports, county agricultural reports from 1780 onwards, each contain a massive chapter on how to get rid of anthills, which were regarded as reducing the productivity of the pastures. There were all sorts of specialised anthill ploughs and so on. And in certainly in, in Leicester and Rutland, which are typical counties, it was reckoned that you could walk from one side of the county to the other just by walking from the top of the summit of one anthill to another massive numbers of anthills, so one must regard them as a typical feature of British grasslands. But in the UK they were reduced by periods of agricultural depression, ploughing in the Napoleonic Wars, um, the depression at the end of the 19th century, the First and Second World Wars, dig for victory, and rabbit myxomatosis, which um, made a lot of grasslands uh, having tall vegetation which eliminated a lot of the anthills. So um, they're much less frequent than they were. I should like to put them back in view of their impact on diversity. But most biologists, even many biologists up to 100 years ago were calling them molehills, um, find them invisible. Quite striking. Uh, most Biologists don't even know what they are. Now, this is a very important ant species. It um, provides up to 165 kilograms per hectare dry weight, whereas termites only get up to half that amount. Uh, and so do the um, 
so do, do Formica rufa, the, the ants which inhabit pine forests. The, um, it hauls up to seven tonnes per hectare of mineral soil to the surface each year, producing a continuous source of bare soil important for many soil animals, and the mounds may last for hundreds of years. This is a, just to go through its life cycle, this is, is a typical head of a, of a Lacey's Flavus worker. Notice how small the eyes are and uh, the eyes only have about 60 facets, typical for an underground ant. As I said, these only appear at night after rain and during the nuptial flight when they mill around on the surface of the mounds, uh, projecting the females and males into the air. So they don't really need, um, they locate in other ways, um, not by sight. The workers are the smallest of the three castes. Um, the drones are basically um, walking, sp flying sperm machines at the top, and the queens are much larger um, and propelled into the air during the nuptial flight. Mating takes place in the air in late August, early September, usually. And then, of course, they go through a typical ant life cycle, laying eggs, then larvae like this, going through five different instars. Um, usually they're producing groups with the queens first in the year, then the drones, and then the workers. One major um, production of each, each year inside the mound. Be, they moved around inside the mound to maintain as high a temperature as possible. These are typical ant larvae, which are fed on a large scale, largely by honeydew taken from root living aphids, carried into the mounds by the workers. And then they pupate, typical ant eggs of pupae. Of course, some of the egg, some of the pupae are, are workers, some are, some are slightly larger and they're gonna be drones and some are much larger still and they are going to be queens, up to say 500 drones and 500 queens producing a vigorous mound each year. Those are some of the drones shown in contrast to the workers. And they congregate on the upper surface of the mounds and release into the nuptial flight. We made a, a, a video on the one show about this a couple of years ago. And uh, then the queens burrow into the soil take their wings off, often in groups of one to 20, and burrow down and establish new colonies. Now, if it's a good year, they might produce eggs soon, um, but before Christmas. But if it's a bad year, it'll be next spring before they really get going. And ultimately they produce these small mounds which are, are present in the vegetation. Once they produced, of course, the workers which produce them and heap soil onto the surface. So that's a typical small mound um, with uh, Leontodon hispidus, um, rough hawk bit, submerged. Rosette species tend to be submerged by the buried soil and eliminated so that they're relatively uncommon on the surface of anthills. Uh, and underneath the soil, they produce lots of channels and chambers in which they rear their brood um, to quite a considerable depth. And this shows three typical features of anthill soil on a mature anthill. One is the presence of heaped soil during summer. Another is the presence of small annual plant species. I've come across about 60 which are frequent on anthills. I don't know whether this one's <laughs> parsley peared or lesser trefoil, but um, it, they're typical of the anthill surface. And thirdly, rabbit droppings, and rabbits tend to defecate preferentially on the anthill surface. This is a typical anthill from acid grassland at Richmond Park with the Pellicella officinarum on the surface. 
and frequently they have large amounts of rock rose and thyme on the surface. So they have a distinct vegetation and in particular the um, some of the mosses, the Pleurocarpus mosses, the creeping ones, are restricted more to the north side than the south side. That's very characteristic of ant hills, enabling you to find your way in fog over mountain grassland. So they're basically producing sand dunes in the grassland. And they're not all occupied by ants because ants frequently, ant colonies frequently die, perhaps when the queens die. And um, so for long periods of time, some of them are unoccupied. And this represents ant hills at Aston Rout National Nature Reserve. There's exactly the same 250 ant hills I looked at in 2007 and 2015 and worked out whether they were occupied or unoccupied and you can see the base what this basically shows is that occupied anthills increase in volume and that abandoned anthills decrease in volume as the chambers and channels collapse. So this also increases heterogeneity because you get plant succession and animal succession on the occupied and abandoned anthills which is rather different. So here are some good examples of anthill populations. Here is some um, Rossidi Down in the Gower. Here is my anthill site on Beacon Hill at Aston Rout National Nature Reserve. And here are the anthills at Blake's Firs, Port and Ranges. Port and Ranges is the best anthill site in Britain, seven square miles with three million anthills, um, owned by the Ministry of Defence, of course, so it's not open to the general public. Lovely chalk grassland, where the anthills occupy sites which were produced at different times in the past. So how long have they lived are the anthills and how fast do they grow? So these ants are considerable engineers. Here's my first estimate from the port and ranges itself showing sites of different ages which were ploughed at different times in the past and as the sites became older the volume of the five largest anthills increased. These are the five largest anthills out of a thousand. So you can see that large anthills increase in size with age. And these are data from Aston Rout. This is rather complicated. Basically, I looked at the same ant hills in 1970, 2007 and 2015. Look at this ant hill volume graph on the horizontal axis and look at ones which are over 40 litres in volume. You can see that in 1970 there were hardly any in, 19, in 2007, there were far more, a far higher proportion were of that volume. And in 2015, far more still. In fact, those green histogram markers show that the anthills were getting quite large. The same anthills were getting quite large by that point. So they do grow with time. This is longevity. This was the same plot at Whiteham Woods near Oxford, where the anthills were mapped in 1955 and 62 years later. Left hand side is 1955, right hand side is 62 years later. And in fact, the black dots show the position of the anthills and basically 21 out of the 29 anthills were in the same position 62 years later as they were before and those which were eliminated were largely eliminated by the invasion of hawthorn bushes. Now this shows the anthill index which is an estimate of the population size increase of anthills um, with time 
these are grasslands. These are only 18 grasslands in this graph, which show the um, ages of sites which I dated by historical evidence. This is Bushy Park here where the medieval grassland was formed in 1498. And you can see basically that the population size of anthills increases with time. It increases, the anthills increase in volume very fast at first, and then they level off with time. And this is, these remarkably good graphs for, for, um, for biological measurements. Now here are two queries which um, Kieran is going to put on the website if he hasn't already done so. How many anthills do you think there are in the four square miles of Richmond Park? And secondly, how many yellow meadow ant workers are there in Richmond Park? Uh, and a series of alternatives where you can add in your estimates uh, to Kieran's poll. Now, these anthills are farmers. They farm underground aphids, just like humans farm sheep and cattle. So there are 22 specialized aphid species which live on the roots of the plants, largely the grasses, and they're characterized by small cornicles which are backwardly projecting um, from the abdomen, and they're normally used to repel ants. But uh, in this case, they, they're very small, and these ants have hairy bottoms. That means they can allow the honeydew to accumulate for the ants to suck it up. Um, at their anuses. These occur in groups. They, the aphids are collected in winter and replaced in spring by the ants. So the ants collect them up in winter and replace them in spring. Um, they collect them in winter and store them in their mounds during hibernation and then they take them out and put them on the roots of the plants around and a high proportion of single clones just like human cattle are. In other words the ants are probably selecting the best most productive aphids and killing off the rest and in that way they maintain a proper um, genetic um, proper proper uh, proper genetic productive genetic strains. I investigated these by looking at um, the I investigated these by looking at um, Tilgren funnel samples from soil taken from Richmond Park. In a Tilgren funnel, some of you may not be familiar with it, you use a bulb to heat a soil sample and the animals, the small animals, less than two millimetres across, um, recognise the heat and the light and go away from it. They go through the gauze and fall into a very pleasant death in alcohol. And then you, you take them out, try to identify them <laughs> and, um, and estimate their numbers. And that was the way I was estimating the seething soils at Richmond Park. This is a Tolgren funnel panel in, in action, a whole battery of 12 Torgren panels, but I had 210 samples. And all sorts of organisms come out of this. Here are some aphids, which I could therefore count and to some extent identify. I'm getting better at it now. Um, it's striking that on three occasions, the worker ants emerged from the base of the Torgren funnel clutching an aphid and they clutching it so strongly that I couldn't separate the ant and aphid. That per perhaps suggests some affinity for, of one to the other. And what's happening is basically that the ants are acting like primary consumers. They're taking the honeydew, which is a sugary solution from the phloem of the plants, and taking it straight to their ant larvae. So these ant larvae are virtually just feeding 
on a sugar solution plus of course amino acids things like that but basically um, that means they can be very very productive and my calculations suggest uh, just like the realization of the old farmers in 1780 that dense yellow meadow, meadow ant populations probably compete with cattle sheep and deer for grass and photosynthate. In other words, where there are plenty of these yellow meadow ants around, there's less production for agriculture. So there are lots of other organisms. Out here. There, are there, lots, are there are lots of springtails and um, lots of springtails around and uh, lovely diversity of mites, 35 different species of mites I found in that grassland. So basically in results, um, each square meter of soil between the anthills contain plenty of worker ants, 2,740 aphids, about 16,200 mites, and about 6,650 adult springtails, um, quite apart from Kieran's earthworms, of course, although earthworms aren't so prevalent in acidic soils. And um, so these mites and springtails are largely decomposing organic matter. The aphids are largely feeding on the plant roots and the ants are feeding on the aphids. So a massive diversity and numbers of these soil invertebrates. And uh, so I was struck by the fact that the ants don't just affect the ant hills. I was under the misapprehension for years. The ants affect the whole of the grassland. These ants are conservationists as well because they increase the range of animal plant species on a site. I recently produced in a paper a list of 40 animal species which are largely restricted to ant hills. So they produce lots of ecological services to the conservationist. Um, in particular, I put in red, they maintain bare soil in grasslands, provided seed germination microsites and animal microhabitats, for example, for, for those wasps which lay eggs um, in bare soil. And they're a refuge for low growing characteristic grass and plant species when the surrounding grassland is undergrazed. There are lots of short-lived plant species which wouldn't occur in a grassland if anthills weren't there. But they also turn over soil, produce massive amount of heterogeneity and microclimatic diversity which wouldn't otherwise take place. Um, for example, uh, the uh, grasshoppers um, largely oviposit in the mounds. Um, they're 16 to 30 times more likely to overposit in ant mounds than they are in the surrounding soil. So there are food sources for the green woodpecker, as many of you will know, and the grey partridge and the chough, actually. Um, they have numerous species of aphids, parasites, caterpillars and so on, which wouldn't otherwise occur in the grassland. Here are some examples. Here's Antenophorus. <laughs> these are about 1 250th of an inch across. And these are parasites on the Laceous flavors ant itself. These crab like front structures go round the head of the ant. So these have their, these are hooked around. The heads of the ant and every time the ant sucks up some honeydew the the, the um, mite puts its head up and sucks some of the honeydew which would otherwise have gone into the ant and these are very prevalent four species just prevalent in laceous flavors mounds. Here is the um, Here is a 
blind white woodlouse called Platyarthrus hoffmansegii, which is quite common in ant mounds of other sorts, but most common in Lacey's flavours mounds. This feeds on the trash dumps produced by the ants. Here are two species largely restricted to Lacey's flavours mounds. This is a beetle called Claviger testaceus, and this is a microdon species. There are about 250 microdon species of hoverfly, which um, whose larvae feed on the ants in the mounds before they uh, pupate and then go out mate, always associated with, and this one's called Microdon devious, which is associated with Lacius, Lacius flavus mounds, and then they lay the eggs in the mounds again and the larvae feed on the ants. Then there's green woodpeckers, um, produce a ma on a massive scale. About 70 to 90 percent of the diet of green woodpeckers in winter is yellow meadow ants. You can see these holes in the surface of the ground and if you look at the droppings they're full of dead ants. So they're worth conserving. Um, they're not likely to colonize new grasslands but they're characteristic of grazed grasslands not mown grasslands. Uh, but they occasionally persist if the blades in the mowers are set high enough. But the best thing is not to mow churchyards, roadside verges and so on. Allow the anthills to grow. So mow, strim or scythe around the anthills in gardens, roadside verges, churchyards or nature reserves. And they're worth introducing to newly established grasslands which lack them. Perhaps they're too far away from established ant hills in order to be colonized by them. In that case, you ought to introduce them if legal requirements can be met. So ant hills are worth preserving when sites are threatened by development. The best time to move them is in winter or early spring where the ants are dormant. Uh, they've been waking up earlier in recent years, of course, but typically in the old days, they used to wake up in say late March. Occasionally it's been January in hot springs recently. Um, they were first moved to protect them from the Iron Bridge bypass in 1985 um, by someone at, I think, Preston Monford um, Field Centre. And um, he used a wheelbarrow and moved 30 anthills uh, for it, a place called Lightmore Meadows. But they tended to collapse. You couldn't get uh, much of an anthill in a wheelbarrow and they, they easily collapse. And so at Richmond Park, we used a compact loader and a tree spade and successfully moved over only five anthills, but as a test bed to a site which lacked them. And so what we did was to take a compact loader with a tree spade on the end. These um, conical bits of soil were uh, about 1.1 meter across and 85 centimeters deep. We created a hole in a grassland about a kilometer away, the flying field, which relatively lacked anthills. We then picked up five anthills, which are threatened by the development of this I think it's called the Beverly Brook at Richmond Park. We plonked them in the mounds and certainly 18 months later, I haven't looked at them recently, but 18 months later, they were still thriving with vigorous ant colonies in the middle. And so it would be cost effective to do this on a much larger scale, moving anthills from place to place where you're saying regenerating chalk grassland or something like that on a new site from arable. So take home messages, large populations of large anthills indicate an old grassland and um, so it may well have accumulated many plant and animal species because the idea is that plant and animal species accumulate with time. Mounds may last for hundreds of years and cover up to 25% of the pasture surface. That's certainly true at Bushy Park in the medieval grassland there more than 20% is quite frequent. They have a major impact on species richness and patterns of plant and animal species diversity. It should be introduced to newly established grasslands which lack anthills. 
and hills and procedures to retain them should be included in management plans and planning applications. Now, this has lapsed in the last 40 years since myself, Peter Grubb and Terry Wells were very keen on anthills, but it, should, it needs to be put back now into planning. This Grassland Index, which I can give people details of if they wish, can be used to estimate grassland age roughly, because a lot of small anthills suggest a recently established grassland, and a lot of large anthills suggest a grassland established say 100, 200, 300 years ago. And the anthill shapes and positions reveal grassland history. For example, here's a, here are a few typical sites. One, this one is at Richmond Park with a path down the middle. You can see on the left-hand side, it's mown. There are no anthills. On the right-hand side, there is, despite appearances, a anthill population emerging on grass and about 25 years old. Although lots of people wouldn't recognize these as anthills, they are there if you look carefully. Then here's another site at Richmond Park. You can see a line of specialized plant species in flower going down the middle. This used to be a site which was the edge of a rugby pitch, probably the Saracens. On the left hand side you can see large anthills which suggest that that was abandoned a long time ago. But on the right hand side you can see hardly any anthills which suggest that that rugby pitch was abandoned much more recently. So you can use these to interpret grass and history. How did this line of anthills appear? Well the answer is it used to be a fence and the anthills are often established around the base of a fence post. And why do some anthills get tall? In this case, the height is greater than the radius. Where the height is greater than the radius, it indicates that in the past, there was tall vegetation growing around, in this case, tall grass, and the, most of the surrounding vegetation probably was ex myxomatosis or something, and the ants build upwards when shaded. They build upwards three times faster and they tend to produce a vertical skyscraper mound. But when grazing resumes, the anthills may well survive, but they retain their old soil shape, producing this sort of shape. This is the largest anthill, I've, uh, the la largest laces flavors I've found. I found this one at Richmond Park. So you can see they get quite big. Uh, thank you very much for watching. And I'd be delighted to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Brilliant. Right. Let me stop that. So I'm going to, because Aaron's internet is better than mine, I'm going to hand over to him to do the Q&A and I'll keep an eye on any new questions that come in from now. Okay. So Aaron, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Kieran. And thanks for that, Tim. It was really, really enlightening, really fascinating talk. Guys, remember, you can um, put your hand up and ask questions directly to Tim if, if you'd like to, or you can pop them in the chat. Um, we've got loads of questions for you, Tim. Um, I'll start with this one from Elaine. Uh, my yellow meadow anthills have recently been very heavily burrowed, burrowed into. Is this likely to have been rabbits, birds, badgers? Um, rabbits sometimes bury, if they're just a few anthills bury, buried into they might be rabbits um so just occasionally when there are dense rabbit populations they can destroy whole anthill population birds are unlikely but badgers frequently destroy anthills and in fact there's an interesting pattern at um, richmond park where perhaps the the badgers affect the anthills uh, bee colonies establish themselves in the mounds where the badgers have colonized and then mice get at the bee colonies. <laughs> um, yes, so, so um, badgers, if there's massive destruction, badgers are likely. If there's minor destruction, holes in one side of the anthill or a, a small proportion of the anthill destroyed, it's likely to be rabbits, but uh, it's likely to be small scale unless there's a massive rabbit population. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Tim. Um, we have a question um, asking, I, I read, sorry, I've lost it. It's gone here. Hi, hi, Tim. I encounter ants in spring utilising cow dung to raise their colonies in acid grasslands. Is this a method used to establish new anthills or is this just opportunistic behaviour due to the thermal quality of the dung? Sorry, I didn't understand one word there. The I was, word. Um, so this is from Emma and she said it that... what? In in spring, she oh, cow, cow dung. I cow see. dung, yeah. Well, I heard that. Now. Um, yes, yeah, so she sees ants utilizing cow dung. Why might they be using that cow dung? Well, Lacey's flavors is very unlikely to be utilizing cow dung, um, but there may be other species utilizing utilizing cow dung. I don't know why they should do so because. Um, in my experience, they seldom do, unless they're utilizing, unless they're predating the invertebrates which have colonized, other invertebrates which have colonized the cow dung, such as dung beetles. Brilliant. Thank you. I have a question from Sarah. I think I read that yellow meadow ants can change the pH value of anthill soils from acid to slightly alkaline. Is this right? And how do they do this? Yes, they're, they're there are about 20 statements in the literature uh, ex comparing the pH of anthills with the surrounding soils. And the vast majority, about 18 out of 20, show that the anthills are more alkaline than the surrounding soils, whether the surrounding soils are acid or whether they're alkaline. The major reason is probably that the ants accumulate high concentrations of potassium ions in the mounds. The, the most consistent difference between anthill and surrounding soils is that potassium ions are two or three times higher in the mounds than in the surrounding grassland. I attribute this to the accumulation of aphid honeydew, which is rich in potassium ions in the mound soils which stays there, although potassium ions are soluble, could easily be washed out. So um, frequently the pH of anthill soils is uh, half a unit or one unit uh, greater than that of the surrounding soils. But you have to remember that the pH is a logarithmic scale. <laughs> and so if it's one pH unit higher, that means 10 times uh, the hydrogen ion concentration is 10 times lower. Brilliant. We have a question from Sarah that's asked, um, is there any more evidence about the beneficial relationship between yellow meadow ants and the northern brown Argus butterfly? We have many good sites for both, often together in the Scottish borders. No, well, there isn't any published information for this. Um, there are two or three um, papers from Germany, 
suggesting that particular species of butterfly are associated with yellow meadow ant mounds, um, but uh, one of them is a is a burnet moss, zygaena, but um, there isn't any firm evidence. The idea is that most of the common blues, um, like the common blue, <laughs> um, actually are only interested in ants, if you like, in the last stages of larval development. Um, and then only if their food plants are present on the mounds. So the yellow meadow ant itself isn't so associated with butterfly and moth species as say uh, Myrmica sabuletii, the one which, um, which looks after the large blue. <laughs> um, and um, basically evidence is lacking and it would be great to accumulate more evidence. So if you could look at this particular butterfly and its lifestyle and its food plant and you might be able to show that the ants take an interest in it but then you'd be producing brand new data which would be very nice. If there's any new young researchers out there and you've got a topic to study thank you for that Tim. Um, I have a question from uh, Sheila. I have both yellow and black ants in my meadow. Do black ants have similar benefits to biodiversity in the same way that uh, yellow meadow ants do? Not to my mind. Um, black ants are tramps. They, uh, they tend to colonise um, human affected areas, new bare soil and so on. They have a much wider range of diet than the yellow meadow ant. So they can feed on any sorts of other invertebrates which are around and often sp they spend about half their time above the surface, foraging above the surface. The, most of the data suggests that they are the first colonists of arable soil. Uh, the, the yellow meadow ants gradually become established over the next 20, 25, 30 years. So that by the time the grassland is 30 years old, uh, the yellow meadow ant predominates and the black ant has almost disappeared. And um, this may be partly because the yellow meadow ant can only colonize once its root aphids are on the roots of the plants, whereas the um, black ant has a much wider range. Um, but they do compete to some extent. Uh, John Pontin showed at Whiteham Woods in the 1950s very clearly that where both are present, the black ant tends to forage above the surface and the yellow ant below the surface. But when the black ant is present on its own, it forages both above and below the surface. So they're probably competing with one another. So on that point then, Tim, does that mean that in, in an urban slash rural area, you'll get more, in an urban area, you'll get more of the black ants and in the rural areas, you'll get more of the, the yellow meadow ants? Oh, yes. I, I think that's undoubtedly true. But whether you get them in the rural areas depends on usually whether the grassland is long-term grazed or not because they're particularly present in long-term pastures. For example, many of the best anthill populations from my point of view um, are in the grounds of stately homes. I've been contacted by people at um, Belton Hall in Lincolnshire, um, Haddon Hall in um, in Derbyshire, all sorts of stately homes, you know, Home Park near Hampton Court uh, and Bushy Park and, and Richmond Park are virtually um, stately homes. Um, and, and these have long-term grazing, uh, allowing the anthills to grow, if you like, to full size. And, uh, but you wouldn't find this in habitually mown grasslands. It's quite striking at Richmond Park. The anthills are largely absent. Um, so they need to be grazed, not mown. Brilliant, thank you. And um, we have a question from Joe. Uh, in a small space like a garden, can one anthill be introduced and flourish on its own, or are they more resilient if there are several hundreds, thousands in an area? Well, obviously, you can introduce an anthill um, if, you, if you wish from somewhere else. And there are plenty of churchyards with just the occasional anthill in. 
you don't have to have a large population at all. They can survive individually. Um, and genetic analysis shows that individual anthills in the population often have quite different genes, which suggests they've been established quite separately. But it is well established that when the anthills are established by just one queen, they stand less chance of survival than if they're established by up to 20 queens at once. The more queens there are, the more chance the anthill has of long-term survival. Mm. Um, Aaron, I'm, I'm just aware of time. We've only got two minutes left. So I just wanted to ask him a quick question because there's been a, a few questions in the chat about uh, how people, where people can find your literature and your anthill index. Uh, are these things that we can link to in the follow-up email? I've put the details of how to calculate the anthill index on the end of the PowerPoint so that people could I suspect access them um, if they wished um, when when they look at the YouTube video. So okay. I put three slides on the end, but basically by trial and error, I produce these anthill index for anthill populations. What you look at is sites which are 10 by 10 meters and look at every single anthill in the site. Then there's an index based on the proportion of anthills, which are more than 70 litres in volume, the average volume of an anthill and the depth of the anthill soil as if it was spread in millimetres spread over the whole surface. And altogether, one compensates for the other because you get a wide variety of anthill sites and you get an index which it seems to reproduce remarkably well how old a site is, but of course the confidence limits for this are very large, especially in large anthills. So a population of large anthills could be anywhere between three and 500 years old, whereas small anthills tend to have smaller confidence limits. Say one, something which appears 50 years old could be between 30 and 70 years old. Um, so I think we'll end it with a question from Richard. He's had his hand up for a little while. So Richard, do you want to unmute and ask your question? No pressure, but it's the last one, so it better be a good one. Yeah, I don't. Um, it's probably not a very useful question for a, a restricted amount of seconds. But I just wondered. You mentioned there were legal um, implications to moving ants around, um, and I just wondered if you could elaborate. And I also was just very quickly going to say that. Um, Dave Simcox said to me once that um, yellow meadow ant mounds are really important for Myrmicus sabaletti because of the microclimate situation, because they're so fussy about their temperature. You very often find them on certain conditions around the bases of the mounds. I just wonder if that might be similar to what's going on with the northern brown argus, just by the way. Yes, that, that's quite possible. I, I've tried to contact Jeremy Thomas about this, but he hasn't replied um, about the large blue and uh, Myrmica sebuletii. The, um, the first question was about... Um, legal legal limitations uh, on moving and on translocation. I put some of these in, in our paper about anthill translocation. You can get the reference from the YouTube video. Um, you can easily transfer anthills within a site like Richmond Park, but where you transfer them elsewhere, you may have to get permission, but I've forgotten the name of the particular name of the act which you have to comply with, but mm -hmm. um, you certainly do need, um, if you like, department uh, um, environment agency um, DEFRA permission before moving anthills from one site to another. Okay, thank you. Great talk, by the way. Yeah, thank you, Tim, for a great talk.